I broke through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows ekrastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin. Today we're going to be talking about Silent House, um, and I'm joined by the co-directors, writers, multi-talented individuals, Chris Kentis and Laura Lau. Um, before we get into Silent House, though, I actually want to sort of take a step back and look on your earlier work. The first film of which, at least feature length, was a film called Grind. Uh, I haven't actually seen Grind, but the thing that immediately popped to my mind when looking at it was that it's a true indie film in every sense of the world. I mean, you had Billy Crudup when he was like a real indie actor. You had Adrian Shelley. Actually, it was his first film. He was a total unknown. Really? You had Billy... Yeah. You, it, was it was Billy, was Billy Billy's first, first film. film. Amanda, a total, un, total unknown. Amanda Peet's first film. Our first film. Wow, that's that's pretty amazing in terms of just like talent scouting. I mean, which definitely comes into play later when we talk about Silent House. Um, what was like the experience like of making Grind? Were you student filmmakers? How exactly did you go about making this feature length film? Well, we were no, we were pretty much just out of school. Uh, I went to NYU, Laura Columbia, and we were making short films and, and uh, while working and you know to pay the bills. I worked as an editor, and, and, and Laura worked as you know, if you are producer's assistant, you know. Um, and uh, it was just something we, we wrote, and then we cobbled together money, mostly family money, and just went out and just did it. And it was kind of like our, our graduate film school making that film. It was, um, you know, we basically just jumped in. After we made a few shorts, we were like, you know what, making a short is so much work. Let's just go for a feature. And we actually shot that on 35 with a, with a whole crew. Um, and we really, I remember like buying like independent filmmaking books at the time just to look up what the crew did. I was like, what does this person do? What is this? We didn't know. We just yeah. jumped in and we knew we wanted to make this movie and, and we made, went out and just made it. But you, you say that the, the grind seems to have the, the true indie cred, whereas grind was like a, a full blown studio production compared to, uh, making open water. Well, it's, it's funny because, you know, grind, I mean, initially when I look at the resume, like, or filmography or whatever you want to call it, um, it looks like a, a Hollywood film because I think now it's like, oh, Billy Crudup, you know, he was Dr. Manhattan in, like, Watchmen. And it's sort of like, oh, wait, this is like, I mean, as you said, the, you discover him. This is like pre-inventing the Abbots and all that sort of stuff. Pre, uh, Pre-everything, even before he did Broadway. I think he did Arcadia shortly after that, and that's when he started Broadway career. Um, he was a total unknown at that time. You know, just this is all the indie uh, scene at the time, and, and we were impressed with him, and we were impressed with Amanda, and she had never done a film either. They were both actually just finishing school. And at the same time, you know, we had a on the crew side. I mean, Therese Dupre, who went on, you know, who was fantastic, and she was already already building a, a resume as a production designer, and now Steve she's Kazmierski Steve Kazmierski as our DP. Actually, that's right, because we uh, shot it non-union. Janie so, Bryant, who went on to do yeah. all the costumes for uh, Deadwood and win yeah. an Emmy, I think. Yeah, if so. you think about it, it was a non-union crew, and it was kind of like I have to say, it was really kind of like the best of the non-union indie crew at that time. And it's kind of funny to think about, it. I mean, obviously you got to mention, Adrian Shelley. Like, this is this is definitely post, I mean, I think the first exposure I had to her was uh, Hal Hartley's Trust, which was right. um, an amazing film. What was it like, I mean, was she th- basically the star going into this film? Like, totally. I mean, Yeah, she was, she was, what the, was, the, experience she was like? the only name going in. What was in. it like working with her then? She was just great, just a very sweet, uh, hardworking, she was a, a dynamo because she was writing and, and putting together her own project at the time. It was before she did her first film that she directed. But she was a, she was a real sweet, you know, hardworking girl. You know, she was fantastic. It was obviously yeah, it was devastating to hear what happened. what happened to her. And as soon as we, as soon as that news one. broke, okay, I'll let you go on. Go ahead. <laughs> I know. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. the tragedy of her death, yeah. I mean, her murder, um, was definitely one of the most shocking things, especially since it was like she finally was getting the – the fame that she had long deserved. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, at first everyone was saying suicide. We were like, no way, no way. You know, she had a little girl, and she had a film coming out, and it, she had absolutely no reason to kill herself. And so and then when we found out it was murder, it made sense. It was just absolutely devastating. What was right when Waitress when waitress was going to go into Sundance, she'd gotten into Sundance. So, you know, she had everything going for her, and then, of course, it, it popped, and it was so successful. It's very, very sad. Yeah. One of the interesting things about grind 
is that you guys were doing so many different positions on the project. And that definitely continued on into the next one, which was Open Water, which came out about 2003. I think you were 2004, saying it was, yeah. it was 2004 when I saw it at SIF. Um, you guys were what? Writers, producers, directors, cinematographers, editors, like... Craft services. Um, I mean, we, we literally made that entire yeah. movie. I mean, I did all the pr production legal. We did... App. The crew was Christopher and myself, my sister... Who's who, a lawyer. Who's a lawyer. My mom. And my dad. dad. The, and basically, they cooked and babysat because we, had, for a little, our we daughter, had a little one. And that was the entire crew with the exception of we had a shark expert for the day. We, we were, mm. you know, with sharks. We weren't going to fool around with that. We had the, the best guy. But other than that, it was just... Us and, and the actors, the so every From all the makeup the, effects, everything. every Production every little design, detail, building camera rigs. Uh, cut it. You know, I'd be you know, we had an apartment in New York, so I'd be like in our living room with saws and plastic and glue and building different rigs <laughs> for the cameras and designing different things. So it was a complete homemade project, homemade, handmade film. Yeah. One thing that occurs to me just while you're talking about doing everything now is, did it ever occur to you? And I mean, I realize you guys are, you know crew people at heart did it ever occur to you to be like maybe we should just act in this movie because we're doing everything else anyway well that's a great question you know you need some talent <laughs> yeah <laughs> and the camera's gotta like the way you look and you know there's some things thank we're you. not we're not thank, thank you. you but uh yeah we're not stupid um <laughs> uh, yeah no, ne never never actually, actually never really occurred you know to what? us it would have been very hard for us to shoot it and act in it at the same time yeah. <laughs> open water has I mean, it gained worldwide fame. I mean, it was one of those films that sort of hit the exact cultural zeitgeist at the right time. I don't know if it was like the, the story that it was based on and all the fear that it sort of generated, but it, it ended up being like, you know, it went from this little indie film I heard it was like $500,000 to shoot, but it ended up... Actually, 100, 100, 150,000. Wow, that's even, that's even more crazy. It was 125. It was 125. I was going to say, what are you talking Ron about? Ron was 150. Yeah. It was 125. 125,000. That was our own savings. Wow. And it ended up, I mean, at least, you know, according to... IMDb making like forty million dollars worldwide. What is it like? Fifty-five, actually. But <laughs> wow, even even more incredible. What is it like to sort of have? I mean, the only other sort of things I can think of like that are you know like a Paranormal Activity or Blair Witch Project that have like such humble beginnings and yet end up connecting with the culture in such a profound way. Well, you know, it's 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 obviously incredible and it was really surprising and, and, and shocking and amazing but the, the most interesting thing is with Grind because we had such a, a wonderful pedigree even though none of these guys were known yet or stars we knew we were lucky to have some really talented people involved and, and we almost kind of we were very much hoping we'd get into Sundance and maybe that movie would take off there was kind of an expectation we had in the back of our heads being young and and, and, and so with Open Water it was never ever about any of that we were, we were scuba divers and I got a dive newsletter and I heard about this story and, and I was following it because I'd keep getting new and, and, and it just shook me to the core because you know this could be us you know we, know we knew what that experience was to be tourists and to get on a boat I'll jump in for one yeah, second yeah. that you can return. And I think at that time, you know, digital filmmaking was just starting and the dogma filmmakers were a real inspiration. And Chris and I, as divers, you know, we would go on vacation and we would shoot. And so we were like, hey, why don't we go on vacation with our family and a couple of friends who are, you know, two actors and, and, and make a movie and take digital filmmaking to a place that we hadn't yet seen it. But But the main difference was... That film was truly a passion project with no real expectation of, of, of anything happening one way or the other. Oh, yeah, well they, well, they all are passion projects, but, but there was, I think we learned from our first one, you know, if you're going to do this, it's really, really hard, and you don't, you know, don't necessarily get rich, and, and you have to love what you're doing. And so uh, Open Water was made, I'll never forget when I finished the cut and had the actors over, and we watched it on the, the Mac computer, and everyone was excited, and I said, See how we feel now, what we accomplished? I said, that's, that's what we did it for. This is our reward, and don't really expect anything else. And so we went, when we got into Sundance, we were shocked when it, it was the first picture to sell that year, and it was the classic Cinderella Sundance story, where like the radio reviews and all this and the big agents and everything else, it was like, wow, this, this really does happen. You know, it was like we hit the lottery. It's, it's kind of funny to think about that you guys are divers because, I mean, it makes sense since the film is very, you know, deep into that sort of culture but 
what is it like as a diver to make a, a film about like a couple that's a, a stranded and gets basically eaten by sharks like that has to be like can you go diving now have you just like created your worst nightmare <laughs> You know, in, in truth, we had a screening shortly like after the, the movie kind of popped because we were worried about that for the dive industry and for the heads of Nawi and Patty. And, you know, they were very supportive. Obviously, we didn't do a love letter commercial, you know, to the dive industry for them. But as a result, I know that a lot of safety measures have been taken and have changed as a result of the film. We're proud of that. Um, so that brings us to now. Uh almost a decade later um maybe you guys can fill us in a little bit on what you guys have been doing since then because i'm sure if there's other things that well you know after the success of open water we started to go after some much bigger projects mm -hmm. and we had a couple of very big passion projects that we were dying to make um one of them was about the sinking of the USS Indianapolis, um, which is a the heavy cruiser uh -huh. in World War II. It was a big picture at Warner Brothers. And we put yeah, a lot, a lot of time into brain. that, and we got very, very close. People have been trying to make that movie for 30 years, and, and we got really close, but not, you know, it just didn't come together. And that, does, and, and that was a heartbreaker for a lot of reasons. And, and one of the biggest is I befriended so many of the actual survivors, and they've now passed on. So, and then the other project. Yeah, go ahead. The other project is something Laura in particular spent so much time researching and, and, and befriending people and going down to New Orleans, and it was about uh, Hurricane Katrina and the, and the immediate aftermath. So we had those, and then we had a bunch of, I mean, we were writing the whole time. So we had, like, basically an original script every year, and then somebody would buy it, and, and we were so naive, especially when a studio buys your project, you think, oh, wow, you know, we're, we're going to make it, not realizing that they buy everything and they make a tiny amount of what they're going to make. Then we had the strike and then the recession. And as indie filmmakers, it was just, it was been brutal. Yeah. And there's a different culture in the studios in that they like to do things a certain way. And, and there's an irony that they hire us because they say, wow, you guys really know how to make something on a budget. And you really, you know, and then you get there and you, we say, well, we want to do it like this and that. And like, no, we're, we're a studio. We don't do things <laughs> that way. Like, like an example was there, one of these projects, there was a, a shot of the moon that needed to be in a, in a project. And, and their visual effects department put down $10,000 every time you saw that moon so they could do a CG moon. And I'm like, I could put a guy in a roof for like three days. I'm sure we'll, the moon will come out. We can get no we don't do things like that <laughs> and so it, it you know it, it was interesting at being indie filmmakers kind of getting a whiff of the culture there and how it's a little bit different you know it's in some ways we're, we were amazed anything gets made <laughs> i mean it's appropriate that you guys sort of somewhat return to that world with uh, Silent House, which is a remake of the, was it Uruguayan film La Casa Muda mm -hmm. um, that came out I guess in 2010. What exactly was your concept? I mean, clearly you're talking about, you know, working on budget and this seems like a film that very much sort of would tie into that with its use of one take. Was that something that you guys brought to the studio or was this, there actually a studio executive that was like, I know the perfect people for this project when they're remaking it? Yeah, basically what happened was that the original La Casa Muda, the Uruguayan, was at Cannes Film Festival last year, the year before, sorry, 2010, in the director's fortnight. And Wild Bunch, the French company, had the remake rights and it, that film. And so the producer who had the remake rights was a fan of Open Water. And she basically was like, she met into somebody that we both know. And they were like, she was like, what happened to those guys who made Open Water? And, uh, she, and our, our, our friend said, um, well, they're in development hell. And she said, well, I have the perfect project. And so they, she basically called us up and said, hey, you know, I've got this film, and it's, it's one continuous uh, shot. And right away we were like... Once, once we heard one continuous take, the hooks were in, you know, because it, it was a chance to, to tackle something really different that would be really challenging. I mean, I think that was the real key to me. It's like suddenly it's, you have to figure out how to make a movie and tell a story in a completely different way. Like all the ways you normally make movies, like all movies are made where you go out, you shoot, you get coverage and uh, you get into the editing room and then you make your movie. And that's how you control pacing and that's how you reveal information, you tweak performances. It's all gone now. And I started as an editor. So it's like, it's all gone. Now you have to figure out how to make a movie and get it all done all while you're there, you know, on set. And and, and uh, it was that challenge that instantly was kind of exciting. Well, what it was the process for us? Like, my assumption when I heard that was that, I mean, it was probably, what, two months of rehearsals or something, and then, like, I don't know how long of an actual shoot. Did you do, like, 
I don't know, dozens of takes of that one take? Or how exactly do you go about making a one-shot movie, basically? Well, you know, it started really with the script. And, you know, once we got the location, just writing the script to tailor it exactly to the location. And then Chris and I just started to run through the whole movie. I would basically play out Sarah's part, and he would have a camera. We started already working through the choreography over and over and over again. Then our DP came on. We didn't have that much time. I mean, we had um, two weeks of rehearsal, uh, so we had um, one week not in the house and then one week in the house with the actors, um, and we shot the entire film in 15 days. I'm going to just jump in and say it, it's kind of the irony of it. It's been so much time between Open Water and Silent House <laughs> is the fact that Silent House was made like at a, like record speed for us because uh, we found out about the project in, in June. I think Laura started the script in early July, and we got it in our heads that we wanted to make Sundance because we just felt it was a great place if we could do it, if they liked the movie and accepted it. Uh, and so it was a real race against the clock, and we ended up premiering at Sundance in 2011, so it was like less than a, a six-month six period yeah. from no script to being in the, in the festival premiering the movie. So it was a real breakneck pace. Um, one of the things that I've been wanting to talk to you guys about, which is great since you guys are both horror people, um, what is it like in terms of horror logic? Because, you know, you'll be in a movie theater, people watch your horror films, and they'll always be like, don't go in that room, that's so dumb, or something like that. You know, people will be shouting out these things. How exactly do you go about writing? Do you sort of try and put yourself in that character and what they would do? Do you sort of try and make those scenes where you know people are going to shout out and cry out and all that stuff? How do you go about sort of balancing that logic in horror films? Well, I don't know about in horror films, but certainly in this project, knowing that it was going to be a continuous take, knowing that it was one shot following one character, it was all about inhabiting her experience and what she's going through and what she would do and what she was seeing and how she was understanding and trying to make sense of what's going on. The entire film is about one character's experience. And so in terms of the writing, it was about really inhabiting her and inhabiting what would make sense logically how you would react to what's happening in the situation and what it was of course that we were trying to reveal to her about what you know ultimately the story is really about yeah the, the film's really about th this journey of discovery through through the eyes of this one character um at the same time we knew that it was going to be perceived as falling within this certain genre it's always amusing to hear that people refer to us as horror people and I completely understand why but when we and it makes total and, and, and that's the label we've gotten but like <laughs> when we made Open Water we really just saw it as this uh, um, telling of, of, of this true life experience that happened to be terrifying but it was almost more of a drama uh -huh. in, in our minds and, and now this we knew was going to certainly air way more in, in, into that genre uh, and so we had to kind of think about for the first time what those conventions are and how the single what, what lured us to the single take isn't just a technical challenge it's that it was a chance to give an audience a completely different cinematic experience. We, we'd never seen this before in, in a in a uh, in a wide release American genre film. We've seen it in art films like Russian Ark and, and things like that. Um, so it was a chance to, to give them a completely different new experience. And we wondered how, if a story is unfolding in this way. Certainly, we're going to bump up against some of the usual things you see within the subgenre of haunted houses and, and some of these devices, and how we can best utilize this single take experience, this single camera experience, to to make these things. Because everything in movies is reinventing. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, make these things feel fresh, and hopefully, maybe approach them from a different way. One of the things that I thought was the most well done aspects of the film, and this also applies to Red State, which came out last year, was the absence or subdued score. That really lets the ambience and creepiness of the scenes play out even more intensely. What, what was your thought process like of that? Was that something you guys had to fight to do? Because it seems like so many films force that score upon you and tell you how to feel. How how. Well, you know, this was the benefit of working with a French company. We had total creative control of the film. So we basically were able to do what we wanted to do. And certainly we wanted the score and all the sound effects to be, uh, of course, complementing the continuous take, which meant that all of that had to reflect both her, of course, the reality of her, the experience of what was going on and also what our character was feeling. Also, it just, you know, everything about taking on this project was, it was... Uh, 
it was a, a challenge. It was like trying to do something new and in a new way, and, and that's what excites us as filmmakers. You don't know if you're going to – you try your best. Hopefully you succeed, but the whole point is to try to do something different. And so even with the sound design, it just seems like a real cheat. I mean, you know, you make a loud noise and people jump. And it just, it, it's just not very interesting or exciting as a filmmaker. And so, you know, we knew that there was a certain number of things that we would have to put in this film to fulfill that kind of genre obligation, but we tried to keep them to a minimum. No, I, th I think it was brilliant. I think it really enhanced it. Uh, Got to talk about Elizabeth Olsen. I loved her in Martha, Marcy May, Marlene. What was it like working with her? Uh, how, I mean, how do you go about picking someone who's the perfect person to terrorize? Well, we were very fortunate because we had casting directors who we'd been trying to work with on all these projects that we were trying to get off the ground between Open Water and Silent House. And they had cast Jennifer Lawrence in Winter's Bone the year before. And so as soon as the script was done, we gave them the script. And they said, we know who, who, who Sarah is. We know, we know absolutely who should play this role. And so they brought her in. We auditioned her. And at that time, there was no tape on her at all. I mean, Martha Marcy was in the post, you know, peace, love, and understanding. She had just finished shooting. And we, you know, we saw nothing. Um, so she came in, we auditioned her, and we knew that we were looking for somebody very special, you know, because of the continuous shot. Well, it was almost too easy, you know, because you're the, the first person, you're one of the first people you look at, and, and it was such a demanding kind of role. There was so many things she needed to be able to do well, and here, here she is, and she had the luminosity, and she had that whole star I'll quality. Just, and, I'll just jump in and say yeah. that, because because of the fact that we knew that the that the, the whole film was going to unfold from this one character's perspective, she needed to be somebody that you would want to watch, and somebody that you would care about, and she had to have that kind of charisma, as Chris was just saying, and the luminosity, but she also had to have her craft. She had to have the, the ability to really handle a, a very unusual shoot, which was very demanding Demanding. You had to have really theater training, and that was something that we that was a requirement for the, the role, which she had. She had gone to Russia and studied theater. She's a very serious actress, um, and we knew that you know you needed somebody who had that ability to 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 concentrate, to have that stamina, and to keep her performance at, at a very high level um, with very very long demanding takes. Well, fantastic. Uh, the film was a lot of fun to watch. Where can people find more information out about you guys? You have Twitters, websites, anywhere that people can find out about the projects that you guys have done and are going to do after this. We're hopeless. You know what? Right you know now. what? I, I think we, we need to jump in and do that. But, you know, as writers and, and directors and also, you know, like even with this film, I, I think that we're, we're very hands-on. It's like we did the color correct ourselves. We did the mix ourselves. We're very technical. And so even just last week I was doing the pan and scan on the TV version. You know, it's like so we actually haven't put our attention so much on doing this kind of thing. And I think we need to. We should probably, like, get, have a website. And right now we're, like, entrenched and in I writing, think, like moving on to the next thing. I it's like you never really think. About I think it's also that it we there. wouldn't think they would be interested. Like, who cares? What, that, that, know, that's the main thing. <laughs> like, like, so our really parents interested? can look. <laughs> I mean, is that the idea? I, I told them, like, when I, when I went and saw this film, I looked on the IMDb, and I was like, oh, they did open water? That's awesome. I was like, where have they been? I would love to know what's going on with them. So I, for one, am that person who would like to know. So what's we, got, we got three people who'd be interested now. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, wait, okay. My mom and your yeah, yeah, so, parents. So it's four. Glad to be okay. amongst the four. Okay. okay. Um, good luck with the film, Lauren Chris. And you can find more interviews at MacGuffinPodcast.com. And see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. It's don't even try to bite the sun. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.